I'm Tim Gale. I'm the Zero Carbon Career Partnership Manager. For those that you that I've not met, um, the uh, partnership has been together for just over two years now. We're more than 80 organisations strong across all sectors, uh, including large organisations, community groups um, and individuals. Um, we have an ambition to be net zero by 2033. Uh, we've done a lot of work uh, with Small World Consulting to put together a Cumbria baseline. We have one um, for the county and that was produced in 2020. And we're working with them now to uh, update that. Um, one of the crucial areas will be uh, land use in, in getting us to that net zero by 2037 pathway. So these, these events are, are really critical to help us uh, understand the opportunities that we have for tackling the climate crisis across our landscapes. Um, and hopefully we can work with you all um, through this event and others um, to promote examples of good practice between us. Um, share our ideas and build our contact network and increase collaboration across this uh, really important subject matter. Um, I'm conscious and, and learning day by day how much is already going on out there. So it's really important for the partnership to understand that and be able to quantify it and understand what that will mean for our ambition to net zero by 2037. So there's a huge amount of um, work for us to do. Um, it's going to require a significant change to how we manage our, our, our land and manage our landscapes. And we're gonna to have to reduce emissions from soil and manage our woodland, peatland, grassland, uh, all very differently in the future. Um, so that's a, a very quick um, couple of minutes um, on the Zero Carbon Cumbria Partnership's ambition for net zero by 2037. And I'm gonna hand over um, straight away to, to David um, Pickup, who will uh, present a little bit more information about the context and the links between the emissions uh, and our landscape. So over to you, David. Thanks, uh, Tim, for that. Can you hear me? Is that clear? David, I'm sorry, you're very faint at the moment, I think. Yeah, I can't hear you very well, David. Um, it's very difficult for me to hear, I'm afraid. I don't know about you, Tim, but um, David was mentioning there are one or two issues in his organization's IT today. I'm hoping they haven't just kicked in at this minute. No. OK. Yeah, I can hear just a very faint, uh, faint voice. I can tell it's David, but I can't tell what he's saying. And um, given, given that, um, should we move on to, to the next presentation, Nigel, do you think, and, and hope we can bring David back after that? I think that's possibly, uh, unless you'd like to say something briefly from your point of view, Tim, just to um, to move on to the uh, significance of uh, peatlands for um, for the net zero agenda and um, both in nature recovery and sequestration, or would you prefer to move on? I think I'll probably leave that to, to David, Nigel. I can always pick it up at the end, if that's okay. Um, I'd like to give David the opportunity to share um, what he's, what he's uh, working on and, um, and his experience, particularly with the work in the National Park, I think that will be um, important for us to hear. So um, maybe if we move on to, to, to Jack from the University of Cumbria, if, if that's not caught you off guard, Jack, if you're, if you're ready. Yes, no problem at all. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Jack. Okay, okay. Can everyone see this? Okay. Yes. Uh, Okay. That All righty then. Job. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is Jack Brennan. I'm a third year PhD researcher at the University of Cumbria, based in Ambleside. Um, and today I'm going to be talking to you about evaluating blanket peatland restoration beyond the surface layer. So, first of all, what is peat? I'm sure a lot of us know this already, but just to cover. Peat's a type of organic matter that forms in wetland environments. It's mainly composed of decaying or decayed plant material, often that of bryophyte mosses such as sphagnum. I like to describe it as pickled plant matter. And here in the UK, it's usually defined as being about, well, equal to or over 65% organic carbon content. But I've got to admit, a lot of the peats that I've looked at in Cumbria are usually around 98, 99% organic carbon. 
So blanket peatlands, peatlands in general um, cover about 3% of the global land area. And uh, blanket peatlands actually make up a really small percentage of that, about 23%. Um, so they're quite a globally rare habitat. And luckily for us in the UK, we attain about 13% of the world's uh, blanket peatlands. We're about second or third countries or yeah, nations um, behind Canada, I believe is number one. And we find them in cool, wet, boreal, temporal landscapes. I think last week really showed um, that we certainly get enough water here in Cumbria to have blanket peatland formation. And we've certainly got a lot of them here in the national parks. They form on gently sloping hillsides or plateaus. So why are they really important? Well, peatlands are our largest terrestrial carbon store on the planet. The second behind the world's oceans is the, you know, the massive um, global carbon store. And they store around 550 to 612 billion tonnes of carbon, which is an obscene amount. And in the UK, they store about 3.12 billion tonnes of carbon, and they sequester about 5.5 million tonnes of carbon a year, which is a, a equivalent to about 1% of the UK's total annual greenhouse gas budget. So blanket peelings play a crucial role in regulating climate and for centuries they've had this net cooling effect on the planet. But 90% of our blanket peatlands in the UK are categorised as a poor condition under the GNCC condition criteria. And that's mainly due to cutting, overgrazing, burning and extensive draining of our uplands. So now our UK blanket peatlands are emitting about 24 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent a year, and that's equivalent to about 7% uh, of the UK's annual greenhouse gas emissions. So that's seven times more than what they're sequestering. So our blanket peatlands are sadly switching towards having a net warming effect on the climate. So what's been done? Well, peatlands have been included in climate policies through restoration targets pretty much ever since the um, Kyoto Protocol inclusion in 2011. So here in the UK, they're included in our Climate Change Act, uh, the Peatland Code, which is a voluntary code to encourage private investment. We've got the Peatland Strategy here in the UK, which sets out all the government plans. We've got the Peatland Restoration Fund, so we're actually getting some money now into Peatland Restoration, which is fantastic. And we've also got to consider the biodiversity benefits of our peatlands, and we're included in Biodiversity Action Plan. But how's it going? Well, the Scottish Government committed to restoring about 50,000 hectares by 2020, and they sadly only achieved 25,000, so only half were rehabilitated. Scotland's now committed to restore 2,500... Um, 250,000 hectares of peatlands by 2030. They've got a long way to go because they've only restored 57,000 hectares at a rate of just over 5,500 hectares a year. England is less than halfway to achieving its 2025 goal. And Wales is only delivering 660 hectares per year, which is three times less than they need to be if they want to reach their 2050 net zero goal. And Northern Ireland is only really just getting started. So we've got quite a long way to go in terms of reaching our climate change targets through peatland restoration targets. So here are two of the major reasons why I, as a researcher, think this is happening. So there's a lack of primary data into the effectiveness of peatland restoration as a nature-based solution. And by that, I mean that whenever we're evaluating if restoration has been successful or not, we're, we're usually just looking at surface indicators, such as extent of sphagnum or the reduction of bare peat surface area. So we're purely looking at this sort of what we see at the peat surface. Um, and through that also, we're having issues where net zero targets are fantastic and we need to reach them. But if peatlands have been having a net cooling effect on the planet for, for centuries, we can actually use peatlands to move towards a net positive climate goal and actually start sucking up that carbon from the atmosphere that they've actually put in there or as we as anthropogenic humans have put into it. So we can take it that next step further. But to do so, we really need the information on how. And for me, it's all about peat structure and function. So the function, and by function, I mean that carbon sequestration and storage potential that peatlands offer, is governed by the physical structure of the peat. You know, 99% of the carbon that's stored in a bog is beneath the surface. It's not the surface layer. So we need to start looking underneath the surface and seeing what's going on. So specifically, you've got things like pore networks. So pore networks control the hydraulic conductivity, which is a result of the limited or influences that limited decomposition and carbon, carbon storage that we expect from our saturated bogs. And you've also got gas movement that pores govern. So where you've got air-filled pores, that's going to be a release path pathway to the atmosphere for greenhouse gases. 
You've also got roots as well, where you've got plant types that perhaps shouldn't be on a peat bog. They can penetrate all the way down into that catatelm that you can see in that diagram, uh, which I've made myself. The, uh, the seas represent the amount of carbon. So the catatelm is where all that carbon is stored. And if you've got roots penetrating down into that um, catatelm, they can provide a release pathway, pathway through the roots themselves for methane. So not great. So what's my project doing? Well, we're applying, if this works, please work. Uh, oh no. Okay, that's not happy. That's a shame because that's a really cool video of um, 3D X-ray microcomputer tomography. So it's a non-destructive imaging technique where you can um, take peat samples and you basically put them through, I like to describe it as, a, as an adapted medical CAT scanner. And that um, uses the attenuation energy of X-rays to actually create a density profile of what you can see. So ultimately, it um, provides a 3D image of the structure of P. And you can use different segmentation softwares to actually identify different elements. So you can identify air fill pores. You can identify water filled pores. You can identify roots and roots that have air bubbles within them. And you can identify roots that are also uh, full of water, which are providing you know, solute, nutrient. Uh, cycling and all that sort of stuff. So it's a really, really novel and cool methodology for actually um, being able to look at peat structure and what peat structure is doing for carbon. Uh, and we've yet to apply it to restored peat soils. So this is a completely new area. And moving on, here we go. So ultimately the image on your right is a 2D slice that you get. So you get about 4,000 slices at a, a 0.51 micron resolution to what we're working at. And these slices stack up on, on top of each other to then produce the image on your left, what you see. And all, the image on your left, you can see I've actually looked at some vegetation that's at the top. So that's a lot of sphagnum. And then within the peat structure, you can see a few, uh, a few macro pores, a few air filled pores. Um, and ultimately, I'm just wanting to illustrate what, what CT is all about. And you can see that I've, I've made a carbon dynamic inference from each of those elements. So where you've got new, new sphagnum growth, that's indicative of, of carbon sequestration occurring. Where you've got water filled pores, that's for dissolved organic carbon and particular organic organic carbon movement throughout the peat column, air filled, air filled pores and air filled roots we've just discussed, and water filled roots again for that dock and park. And the peat matrix itself, you can look at the bulk density of the profile based on, on the density that you see from the attenuation of x-ray. So it's a really cool novel technique. Jack, sorry, um, just on the previous slide, uh, we've noted that we are seeing a presenter view, I think, rather than slide yes. optimized. Uh, let's have a look. To so be able to maximize that so we can just see the diagram more clearly, that'd be brilliant. Yeah, I'm not sure why that's doing that. Uh, display settings? If it's not straight forward, then How's just that? carry on as you were. No, no, there we are, perfect. Is that Thank better? You very much. No problem. So yeah, sorry. So yeah, that, that should show it a little bit more clearly. Uh, the image on your right, you can see some root systems within there. Where it's black, that's air, so that's air space. And where you've got that grainy sort of gray matrix, that's the peat itself. Fantastic. So then just taking a little step further, I'm trying to um, approach peat restoration quite holistically, and I'm, I'm looking at the wider um, the, the wider carbon balance equations of peat restoration. And something that isn't included in our emission saving reportings is the carbon footprint that it takes to actually restore blanket bogs. And we know that whatever carbon you're going to be putting into restoring um, a blanket peatland, you're going to get it back because the peatland itself will start saving emissions. And that's all well and good. But when we're actually reporting these um, carbon payback times and these, we're actually you know trying to get private investment in peatland restoration, we need to be quite um, analytical and quite critical of the carbon and to be really... Um, well, for ethical reasons, just be correct in, in the carbon that we're reporting. Um, so I'm also applying something called life cycle analysis, which is um, a technique used to calculate the environmental impact of an activity or product. Um, for us, it's a little complex because blanket peatland is an event where products and services are used. Um, and so my project's basically looking at forming a baseline of the one-way carbon cost um, it goes way beyond the scope of this investigation to do a full carbon uh, balance and put in you know, a lot of interest into this CT and structure and function. But this is a really important part. So what have I found so far? Um, so here you can see it's a slightly warped image, but you can see an image of um, on the left, we have uh, the, 
the projections from X-ray CT in color of the peat matrix and then the vegetation at the top. Then the middle image, we've got a site where we had um, a good restoration outcome after five years. So a sphagnum lawn has formed on an area of their peat. The restoration was doing what it needed to do. Whereas on the right, you've got a peat core that was taken from an area where the restoration had failed. So it was still bare peat, it was still eroding, uh, and it was still releasing its greenhouse gas emissions. And you can see this is just a picture of the porosity. So looking at those pore networks within, there's a huge difference between these two cores. You know, the, the degraded side that you see on the right, I almost like to describe it as a, a block of cheese. It's just full of holes. It's full of air-filled holes. And that's just going to be releasing greenhouse gas emissions to the atmosphere on a continual basis. Whereas the core you've seen in the middle, it's actually looking quite good in terms of what we want from um, peat function and peat structure at a restored site. So this is just giving an example of what CT can do towards evaluating peatland restoration. I've also been in the labs uh, doing some bulk chemical analysis uh, to then compare with the uh, X-ray computer tomography and that's to, to really ground it in the literature. And you can see that at that pore site where I, I said, it, you know, it's almost like cheese, there's a massive variance in the moisture content within that sample. And that's obviously going to be related to the greenhouse gases being released. And again, you can see differences in bulk density, a slight difference in orga organic carbon content of the good core having more carbon within it. A massive difference in pH, which obviously makes a huge difference for, for the sphagnum growth that you want there. Redox potentials, vompo summification. There's these huge differences between these two sites. And I'd like to add that these sites were only 12 meters away from each other. So on a spatial basis, that's a massive difference. So that's why we really need to go beneath the surface when we're evaluating our peatland restoration. And finally, that carbon footprint of restoration there's a significant difference between what method is used on a, on a bog. And I know that some methods, in fact, a lot of methods aren't that comparable to each other because it's so site dependent. But if ever there's a scenario in peatland restoration where we're given a site where we have options for multiple different methods, we should always be leaning towards the method that's going to have the least carbon costing behind it. So, for example, some methods has a, had a 54.7 times um, greater carbon footprint than using another method of bare peat restoration. So we really need to start considering that moving forward, and that's going to reduce the carbon payback times from our projects and hopefully encourage that private investment that we need. So finally, three points. The subsurface of peat needs to be investigated post-restoration if, if we are to truly understand the effectiveness at restoration as a nature-based solution to climate. X-ray computer tomography is a really effective tool for evaluating the impact of restoration on peat structure and inferring that function, that word function we really need to start focusing on. And finally, the carbon footprint of the, of the restoration methods that you use will make a difference to that carbon payback time. And I very much look forward to continuing my research and having some outputs. So thank you all very much for listening. Uh, yep, yeah, my name is Jack, um, University of Cumbria, um, uh, ERDF funded through the EcoI Northwest project. Um, and I'm associated with a part of the business, Barker and Bland Limited, who are peatland restoration practitioners. And they've had a wonderful um, assistance for me. So yeah, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much indeed, Jack. That's fascinating and um, yeah, fascinating and, and slightly worrying in equal measure, I think, isn't it? When you see the uh, see the rates of restoration across the across the UK. But yeah, thank you very much indeed for, for sharing that. Um, Nigel, um, do, do we want to go back to David or do we want to use um, the next five minutes for the first Q&A? How do you want to play that? Is David back on the call? Hi, uh, Tim, can you hear me? Ah, brilliant. David, you're yeah, back. Yeah, I'm here. Fingers I've crossed. been in and out. Well, yeah. while the going's good, should we, should we try? Yeah, try why not? To... Let's do that. Okay, that's Thank great. You. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, David Pickup, Carbon Monitoring Officer for the Zero Carbon Cumbria Partnership. And I'm just going to do a really quick talk through the links between peatland emissions and the carbon baseline for Cumbria. I've been just really impressed with Jack's talk, which actually uh, I'm going to rejig a little bit to take some of my speech back, but hopefully can build on his as well. Um, one of the key things that Jack highlighted is that we're not hitting our targets for uh, peatland restoration. And obviously, it's an incredibly important piece of work we need to do in terms of combating climate change, as Jack has started to highlight. So what's happening at a national level? 
Well, December 2020 saw the release of the Climate Change Committee's six carbon budget. Uh, the budget is required under the Climate Change Act and it's designed to provide ministers with advice on the volumes of greenhouse gases that can, they can emit during the period 2033 through to 2037. Now, in the six carbon budget, the Climate Change Committee advised that the area of UK peatland that is re-wetted increases from 25% up to 60% by 2035, and then again increases again to 79% by 2050. And that, along with a lot of other measures that they highlight, they hope that they'll be able to deliver abatement, uh, annual abatement savings of nearly 6 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent by 2035 and around 10 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent by 2050. Now that's impressive, but that's against a backdrop, according to the Climate Change Committee, that current UK peatland emissions are around 24 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent. So you can see the scale of the issue that we're up against and the need for urgent action. At the end of January 2021 as well, uh, we saw the formal inclusion of peatland into the UK greenhouse gas emissions inventory. And that addition added 3.5% to overall national emissions, which gives you a, an idea of the scale and the impact that peatland can have. So what are we doing at a ZCCP level? Well, in February 2020, Small World Consulting produced the first carbon budget baseline for Cumbria. And currently they're undertaking the 2023 re-baseline for Cumbria, which will be released in the next few weeks. Now, in response to the changes in methodology and the clear focus on peatlands that have come to light over the last few years, as part of that re-baseline process, Small World Consulting have drawn on national and local peatland data sets to gain a deeper understanding of what will be required at uh, a Cumbria level. And can I just say a big thanks to Cumbria Peak Partnership, Yorkshire Peak Partnership, North Pennines AOB, Cumbria Biodiversity Data Centre, Cumbria Local Nature Partnership and the Lake District National Park who have all helped with this process. The new baseline, we hope, will give us a clearer understanding of the scale and urgency of work required in terms of peatland restoration. And it was really interesting just to hear Jack's talk then, and it's really helped me, in that we know there's a huge amount of data being collected out there by multiple organisations working in this field. And if we're going to understand the scale and the speed that we're going to have to work at, we're going to need to share that information uh, more readily and more than we do now so that we can uh, understand our under <clears throat> hone our understanding even further. So that's the real main driver. I think you can see that obviously peatland restoration is incredibly important. Uh, and if we're going to move towards Cumbria's journey towards net zero, it's going to be a critical piece of our work. OK, thanks for that. Thanks very much indeed, David. Um, yeah, indeed, it's um, it's going to be a critical part of that of that pathway, and I, I look forward to our latest baseline uh, data update that will, I'm sure, help us uh, focus on on how we best achieve that. And I'm sure many of the people on the call will be critical into into uh, realising that uh, that ambition. So we're going to move quickly straight on. You've probably seen Nigel's put in the chat that I think we'll we'll look to take some questions and answers from. Um, 245 ish but if I could move on to to Gemma um, from Cumbria Wildlife Trust now um, Gemma over to you thanks thank you um, I'm just going to share my screen now can you see that oh, that's... we can we can thank you Gemma you you put it, yeah perfect thank you well that's great um, well first of all thanks for having me um, I'm quite new to the area, so I'm the new um, peatland team manager for Cumbria Wildlife Trust. Uh, I've just been in post since November last year, um, so it's great to come along to this and, and hear from other people in the area as well. 
Um, so my job um, is to lead and coordinate our programme of peatland projects in Cumbria and um, ultimately ensure that we're contributing to nature-based solutions um, to various environmental issues, including climate change. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Cumbria Peat Partnership, um, the Great North Bog, um, a couple of our projects which fall under um, the Great North Bog West project. Uh, we have a lot of confusing project names. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about Eyes on the Bog, which is a brilliantly named um, volunteer um, monitoring initiative. Um, so the Cumbria Peat Partnership, um, I've just put up the logos of all of the organisations which are currently part of the partnership. Um, I won't read through them all, but I can provide a list if that's helpful. Um, so the, the purpose of the partnership is to share knowledge, um, develop best practice and actively support restoration of peat habitats in Cumbria. Um, at the strategic level, we're also looking to build um, the business case for peatland restoration and um, secure more funding. Um, within the partnership, um, it's the Cumbria Wildlife Trust, which is um, the secretariat for the partnership and also the lead delivery partner. Um, going back to the objectives of the partnership, which were originally set out, um, one of the key objectives was that by 2020, we would seek to achieve favourable management conditions of 2020 hectares of peatland habitat in Cumbria. Um, so we um, produced a report in 2020 called Peatland Restoration in Cumbria, which is a really comprehensive report. Um, and it showed that work over the previous decade by Cumbria Wildlife Trust on behalf of the partnership led to almost 4,000 hectares of peatland restoration. Um, so that's really good. We surpassed that initial target of um, over 2,000 hectares. Um, but what it did show, and this isn't surprising, is that there's a lack of good quality data available to guide further work and help inform ongoing decisions. Um, so the report used local and national data sets to estimate the extent of peatland habitat in Cumbria. Um, it looked at carbon budgets and it looked at the funding that would be required to undertake field surveys um, that would get us enough data pr to prioritize future restoration plans. Um, so some key findings of the report um, so that an estimated um, over 88,000 hectares of peatland habitat in Cumbria, um, storing an estimated 9.2 million tonnes of carbon. And that was just in the vegetation and top 30 centimetres of the soil. Um, the analysis suggests that in the current condition, uh, these peatlands are emitting over 200,000 tonnes of CO2 equivalent every year. And the report compared that figure to the carbon cost of visitors coming to and from the Lake District, um, which at the time was estimated at over 900,000 tonnes CO2 equivalent. Um, and it was also estimated that um, £931,000 would be required to carry out sufficiently detailed field surveys, so surveys that look at peak condition, vegetation and peak depth, um, and to be able to conduct landowner, landowner engagement to get sites to the point where they are ready for restoration. Um, and that doesn't inc include the cost of the actual restoration work itself. That's just getting the projects ready to go. Um, so three years on, the report is still a really useful guide, um, but obviously there's some, we've done a lot of work in those past three years. We need to update figures and ensure that the, um, the plans of the Cumbria Peak Partnership link to the plans of our funders and partners and all of those policies. Um, to make sure that we're working um, as effectively as possible. Um, so this is just one of the maps from the report. It shows the extent of peatland habitats across Cumbria, um, colour coded for different types of habitat. Um, and by comparison, this is the extent of the restored sites as of April 2021. Um, so that shows really there's a lot of work to be done. Um, we need to draw in more investment um, and we need to make the best use of all of these partnerships um, that we are a part of. Um, and this is kind of where the Great North Bog comes in, which um, is another partnership which you may have heard of. Um, 
this is a really ambitious um, peatland restoration initiative. Um, it brings in a load of different peat partnerships in the north of England. Um, and really, it's a it's a strategic partnership. Um, so if you look at the, the extent of um, peat in the north of England, um, it's, there's actually about 92 percent um, of upland peat in England is found in the within the Great North Bog area. Um, so by working in partnership here, there's great opportunities for delivering more peatland restoration objectives of the environment plan. Um, one way um, in which the Great North Bog partners have worked together um, is to develop a project that we are part of called the Great North Bog West Project. Um, and if you can see those two green circles on the map there, um, this shows the, the areas that the Great North Bog West Project is taking place in. Um, so essentially it's the, the National Trust, Country Wildlife Trust and Forest of Boland EUNB. Um, partnership are working together um, along with United Utilities and other local estates to explore and, and deliver restoration of upland peatlands in the northwest. Um, so bringing in all of those partnerships to um, make more of an impact and secure funding for larger scale works. Um, so we secure grant funding through the Nature for Climate Peatland Grant Scheme. Um, this grant scheme has two phases of funding. Um, one is called discovery, the other is restoration. Um, and between the two of them, we have a 2.4 million pound project, which will run until March 2025. So the discovery project will involve surveying 6,000 hectares of degraded peatland, um, will develop restoration plans and undertake landowner engagement to create spade ready projects. Um, so within Cumbria, we're looking at 13 sites currently. Um, so one of our peatland officers is very busy with that project. Um, running alongside that, we have the restoration project, um, which kind of does what it says on the tin. So it will deliver restoration plans created through the discovery phase. Um, stage one of the restoration will restore um, around 1,000 hectares of peatland um, across the whole project area, and that's about 895 hectares in Cumbria. Um, so the idea is that as we go on through the discovery project, we'll hopefully get more projects that are ready to go, and then we can put them into restoration as well. But it's a case of constantly um, weighing things up, getting the funding in place and getting the staff in place um, to keep it running. Um, so in terms of discovery, um, our field officers, they'll be out looking at peat condition. Um, so that's just a big area of exp exposed peat there. They'll be measuring peat depths and um, they'll be doing vegetation surveys and looking at the general condition of the site. Um, so that's just some of our brilliant peat team. Uh, they'll be doing vegetation surveys as well. Um, that's Mel with her dog, <laughs> who's been helping her on the surveys this winter. Um, and then when alongside that, we'll have restoration projects. Um, so this just shows uh, one of the diggers out on site doing some hag reprofiling um, and the idea is that we'll end up with some beautifully restored um, peatlands. Um, so that's kind of just on you know just well essentially two of the projects that we're working on at the moment the Great North Bog West discovery and restoration projects um, and most of our work is currently focused on on the restoration side of things um, but it's also so important to collect data um, so as part of the discovery project for the Great North Bog, um, one of our objectives is to be part of the Eyes on the Bog project. Um, this is a sort of UK-wide um, monitoring project um, developed by the IUCN Peatland Programme. It's a really simple, repeatable way of collecting data um, on the success of the monitoring. It's very, very low tech. Um, and the idea is that volunteers can be trained up and it'll provide some sort of consistent monitoring across UK sites. Um, so again, just some um, staff and volunteers out on site um, installing some of this low tech kit. Um, so the pipes, the, the tubes that you see there, um, they are dip wells. So they'll be inserted into the ground and you measure um, hydrology. Um, we also have, so that you can see going from left to right here, on the left, we have um, what's called a, a rust rod. So 
part of the um, part of the surface of the rod underground is exposed. It's just a metal rod in the ground, and you can look at um, whether it rusts the oxidi oxidization. So that tells you about the um, level of the water. And then in the middle, we have what's called a surface level rod. So it's another long rod. It goes right down to the mineral base. Um, and you're basically looking at the level there to see if the peat has grown up around it or if it's shrank. Hopefully we don't want that to happen. And then on the right, um, with a tin can over it, um, that's one of our dip wells. And we have automatic um, data loggers in there as well to track um, changes in water levels. Um, so we put out a call out for volunteers last year. Um, really happy to say we've got 27 volunteers signed up for this. Um, we've done an initial um, online introduction and then we're going to meet them on the 2nd of February on site um, to look at this in person. Um, so we've combined that with World Wetland Day. Um, and if you are interested in volunteering um, with the Cumbria Wildlife Trust, I mean, there's a whole load of different ways you can get involved. But if you go to our website, um, you can have a look at the different opportunities that we have coming up there as well. Um, so what's next for us? Um, well, we're covering a program of peatland projects at the moment. We have eight live projects currently, um, and I've only touched on two of them there. So we have quite a lot on. So we'll be delivering that program of works um, all the while trying to identify and pri prioritize new sites and securing the funding for those sites and securing the funding to, to staff the ongoing um, exploration side of things. Um, we'll continue to develop joint peatland initiatives with our partner organisations, which is proving really successful um, way so far. Um, and we'll also be looking to develop more opportunities for volunteering, um, placements and community engagement. Um, so we're looking at maybe hosting a student placement later this year. Um, so that would be really great. Um, so, yeah, that's me. Um, if you want to email me, my email address is just there. And uh, yeah, look forward to answer any questions later on. Thank you. Thanks very much for joining us, Gemma. That's um, that's a really fascinating um, run through and so <clears throat> encouraging um, to to see what's actually happening out there and um, some of the projects that you're um, that you're working on. And I certainly hadn't appreciated the geography of the deep peat of the north of England. That slide's really powerful, isn't it? In terms of bog is contained in the Great North Bog. So yeah, really I. Um, we're going to move on now to, to Kate from the North Pennines AOMB partnership and then it'll hopefully leave us time for 10 minutes or so of, of questions and we'll do our best as well to, to pick up the questions that are, are in the chat as well. So over to you Kate, thanks. Great, thank you. Um, can everyone hear me and see my screen? Hello? Yep, can see the screen. <laughs> Just like Great. to put it into um, the slideshow view, please, Kate. Yeah, no problem. So, thank you. Great, thank you. Yeah, so um, my name is Kate cartmel and I'm a, a Peatland Field Officer for the North Pennines a and Partnership. Thank you very much for having me today. Uh, I'm just going to give you a, a whistle-stop tour of some of the um, peatland restoration te techniques that we use here in the North Pennines, um, some of our plans for the future, and also some of the benefits of peatland restoration aside from the, um, the carbon benefits that we've already discussed. As I said, I work for the North Pennines AOMB partnership. Uh, we're a protected area that includes parts of County Durham, Cumbria and Northumberland. Um, and we have a lot of um, peat in the North Pennines, um, upland blanket bog mainly. Um, and we also have a lot of bare peat. So 2,900 hectares of bare peat and 10,000 kilometers of grips. Um, and grips are the mole and drains that were put in after the Second World War to try and increase agricultural productivity. So uh, the North Carolina's AOB partnership have had a peatland programme for around 15 years now. Um, and when it first started, the focus was mainly on grip blocking. Um, so this picture on the, you can see on the left has grips that haven't been blocked and, and then on the right, grips that have been blocked. So it basically creates a, a series of, of pools that slows the flow of the water through the grip and off the moor. Um, and we've now completed around 70% of the grips in the North Pennines. Um, and the technique that we mainly use um, where we can is using diggers to create peat dams. So they peel the vegetation off um, the top of the grip and dig some peat out from within the grip itself, create a, a dam um, and then put the vegetation back on top. 
Um, and this creates, yeah, like I said, a series of pools. Um, but generally we find over the years, the longer the, the dams are in place, they start to fill in with sphagnum mosses and other species. Um, and it just uh, makes the, the more overall a bit wetter. Um, and also the, the sphagnum and other species start to spread out um, into the, the rest of the vegetation. So some of the benefits of this are um, obviously reducing the flood risk downstream. As I said, we're creating pools that are there year round. So even when the moors are really, really dry in the summer, um, these still tend to hold water. So uh, as well as providing drinking water for animals and birds, um, it also encourages in insect life. So um, there's more of a food source as well. Um, it also reduces um, the risk of wildfire. And um, I should have mentioned that when the grips are blocked, the diggers also reprofile the, the edges of the grip. So rather than being very steep sided, um, they're more of a gradual angle. Um, and that means that uh, there's less chance of stock falling in. And if they do go in, they can easily get back out again. Um, it stops the grips from eroding away and more peat being locks, lost. Um, and it also reduces the amount of peat that's being washed into watercourses and improves the quality of the water. So uh, now that we've got quite a significant way through all of the grips in the North Pennines, um, they started to focus on looking at how we could restore the areas of bare peat um, instead. Um, as I said, there's a lot of bare peat. This is quite a typical area for the North Pennines. We have um, these dendritic erosion gullies uh, with lots of water flowing down them, um, eroding away the peat. Um, eventually it gets down to the mineral layer. Um, we also have hag edges, so um, steep faces of bare peat that erode away, um, and also just flat, flat areas of, of bare peat. Um, so the, the AMV partnership developed a five-step process for restoring bare peat. Um, this is what works best um, up here. Obviously, it's different in different parts of the country, but up here we have sites that are at quite high, high altitude. We get a lot of snow, we get a lot of very cold, wet, windy weather. Um, it's just <laughs> generally a bit grim. Um, so the five steps, uh, I'll run through them very quickly, but um, I don't have time to go through in detail. So if you want more information, there will be some more on the website. Um, but first of all, we similar to the grips, we address the hydrology. So we're trying to slow the flow of water off the moor. So we're installing um, leaky dams. Usually we use stone or timber or coir, which is coconut matting um, or peat dams. We've also started experimenting with wool as well. Uh, but basically trying to raise the water table um, and also it traps, traps sediment that or peat that would otherwise be washing off the moor. Um, and that starts to back up behind the dams. And the second stage is slopes. So we're reprofiling the, the hag edges. So this is a before and after you can see, um, and basically taking it from a, a steep or vertical angle that's eroding away to something um, more gradual so that vegetation can come back um, and also so to stop the peat eroding away. And the third step is brash. I think this is probably the key thing that we've found works the best here. Um, and that's where we cut um, donor material, um, which is typically sphagnum mosses, feather mosses, cotton grasses, um, heather from other sites or other areas on the site. Um, and then we transport, transport it onto the restoration site um, and spread it out using pitchforks. Um, I should say that we do use helicopters for pretty much all of our work. Um, the sites that, we, that we're restoring are just too bare and too sensitive to be able to track any of the materials on site, um, even with track vehicles, it just makes a big mess. So everything we do um, pretty much is done with helicopters. Um, and then the brash, once it's spread out, it acts like a mulch. It stabilizes the bare peat um, and it provides a, a seed source and a growing medium for plants to start to come back. Um, and this works really well. And we tend to find that we get a, a sort of a living carpet of mosses that come back initially and then other plants start to seed into that. And the fourth step is revegetation. So we then apply small amounts of lime, fertilizer, and mullein seed mix to the brash. Um, we find on a lot of our sites, obviously, the, the blanket box is supposed to be acidic, but the, the pH has fallen so low that it's become prohibitive to, to plant growth. So we raise the pH a little bit and then we just give everything a bit of a kickstart to start that revegetation process going a bit quicker. Um, and we also use cotton grass plug plants as well in some cases, which you can see in this photo. And then the final step is reintroducing sphagnum. So we either um, use sphagnum that we transplant from other areas of the site um, and harvest it and then plant it on the bare peat, or we use um, specialist plugs that we buy and um, grown for us from nurseries. But again, the idea is just to get 
the process going a little bit quicker and we get more sphagnum back on the site. So some of the benefits um, of restoring bare peat, aside from the carbon benefits, uh, again, obviously reducing flood risk downstream, um, preventing the loss of any more peat um, or any more vegetation, um, improving the water quality, again, we're limit, well, reducing the amount of peat that's being washed into watercourses, um, and also increasing species, species richness, diversity, um, biodiversity, and providing a much better habitat um, than bare peat alone provides. And then I'm just going to run through some before and after pictures of some sites that we have restored um, in Cumbria previously. Um, so this is on Warcock. This is a, a Ministry of Defence owned um, site. And same here, this is a, a timber dam. Um, we find that just, just by slowing down um, the flow of water and um, yeah, reducing that movement, you get a lot of vegetation coming back in pretty quickly. And this is on Hartley Common. We also use drones and UAVs in our work. Um, and they're really useful for getting images like this so that we can, can compare the, um, the effect that the restoration has had and um, see how much we've reduced the bare peat area by. Again, I'd love to, this demonstrates very well the, the living carpet of mosses that I that mentioned. Um, so we hope to see more plants um, seeding into that as time goes on. Uh, and in terms of future plans, similar to the Cumbria Wildlife Trust, we uh, a lot of our funding at the moment is coming through the Nature of Climate um, grant scheme. So we also have um, a lot of sites uh, that are in the, the restoration um, phase. And then we also have sites that we're going to be surveying through Discovery. i um, just listed all the ones that we'll be doing in Cumbria here. Uh, but there are also others, obviously, outside the Cumbria that we're working on too. Um, so plenty to keep us busy. Uh, that's it for me. I've just put a link to the website here and also our social media account. So if you want um, any more information or also look at things in more detail, um, there's plenty to go, go through on there. But thank you very much for listening. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Kate. Um, really um, powerful presentation. I think, you know, that illustration through those images is, uh, as I say, very powerful indeed. And uh, I think it, it shows... Um, the type of success that those interventions have had really well. So thanks very much indeed for, for joining us. And um, Nigel, I think we've got, um, according to my, my clock, uh, 10 minutes or so for questions. Um, do, you want to, do you want to start with um, uh, items that have been raised in the chat or, or do we want to do a bit of raising of hands? Um, I'll work through the chat if I may, uh, Tim, thank you. Sure. There's been a number of great questions and I will try and get through them today or, or if not, we'll follow up afterwards. But um, okay. If the presenters can answer fairly succinctly, that would be a, a huge help. Thank you. Um, so first of all, David Haley has got a question for Jack asking about um, carbon payback and whether there's a difference between old long term stored peat and then stored term, a short term release of new carbon. Um, yes, yes, there is. So on a naturally functioning peat bog, you've got the vegetation that uh, soaks up carbon through photosynthesis, and then you will lose a lot of carbon through autotrophic respiration processes. But because the peat is so saturated, when the sphagnum perishes, when it dies, which it usually does on a four year cycle, um, the sphagnum itself gets locked into the peat and that is the carbon store. Where you've got a site that was completely bare and has been restored, it's just it's always releasing emissions constantly, and that's coming from that old uh, locked-in carbon store, which takes thousands of years to be there. So that's really negative. Um, so when you go in and restore, when we talk about carbon payback time, we look at well, when are we capping the emissions? So if we if we stopped the emissions being released from that long-term store, and then as time progresses, you can start to identify, well, what's the new carbon? Are we starting to actually re-sequester carbon or re-sequester more carbon than what the bog is giving off? Um, it's a long process. There's peatland studies that have been going on for about 35 years now that are still finding that peatlands are releasing more emissions than they're sequestering. Um, so it's a really interesting topic and a good question. Thanks, David. Thanks, Jack. And I know we could spend a day on many of these things. There's an incredible amount of, uh, of technical expertise in, in, even in this call. Um, Paul is asking about, um, well, he mentions um, peat in Asia is very loosely protected if over 50 centimetres thick. And do any of our presenters have a view on how we should define peat in Cumbria to prioritise protection and restoration? 
I think is Jack nodding there. Anybody, uh, any of the panel willing to come in on that one? Are, are there particular bodies of vulnerable Pete that they think need enhanced protection? I'll, I'll quickly come in and then obviously someone else please take over. But um, our bear peat is a really controversial topic. You know, bear peat is the worst possible condition for peat to be in. And it's our greatest emitter in the UK. We've got over 5,000 hectares of it, just the bear peat just up in the north. Um, so we really need to, to prioritise stopping the emissions coming from our bear peat. And then the other side of the coin is you've got some areas that are, you know, on this borderline only emitting a little bit but are slowly starting to get worse. And if you stop those quickly, they can actually start sequestering more carbon than they're giving off. So it's sort of like working at the two opposite ends of the spectrum and then working our way in, is, is, is my opinion. Thanks, Jack. Um, anybody else like to come in on that one or we'll move on to another question? Uh... Okay, I'll, I'll move on, uh, just um, bearing in mind time. Any, anyone's free to come in, but... Um... Hazel's asking about um, the uh, time lag between restoring work uh, at peatland and, and the resulting carbon savings and whether we need to front load this work and do all of the, the restoration early if we're aiming to get uh, to net zero by 2037. So how does this work uh, time-wise? I suppose the earlier the better. Um, yeah, the sooner the better. Um, I think all we're limited by really is um, resources <laughs> um you know the more the sooner we have more resource and if we can get longer term funding as well so that we can get those that pipeline of sites um if we can make longer term plans to schedule our works rather than being so reactive to maybe shorter term funding then yeah yeah um don't know if anybody else has anything to add but it's obviously a huge priority um but it takes resource and and planning um and funding is required to to build on that. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. The, so, the sooner the better, but um, we're limited by well, for, for us up here, we're we're limited by um, the shooting season. So we're working pretty much entirely with grouse shooting estates. So um, we we can't we're, we're limited to a window between usually around November and March. So we get the the worst of the weather, and then we obviously we can't um, do some of the work when it's snowing as well. So um, we're snowed off for some of that too. Um, so that makes our, our window very tight. Um, but also just the, the way the funding works, especially um, with funding coming um, from DEFRA and from government, obviously it works in always in a very short term way. And that means that our contractors can't um, plan long term and they can't um, increase their own capacity because there's no guarantees beyond the, the three year mark, even if we were working at, a say, five years ahead of, of now in terms of um, funding and planning, that would be really helpful and um, for the contractors to be able to plan ahead and, and, and invest in in more capacity because there, there aren't that many people doing especially this kind of work and um, that we that we need and they struggle to get staff and uh, yeah just the, the more investment and the more long term we can make that investment I think definitely the better. 100% and to, to add to that Kate we've also got the issues of nesting bird season as well you know we don't have a 12 month cycle of being able to do peatland restoration so we've got the issue of resources of having ecologists with us on site It'd be really useful if we can actually get um, an influx of, of ecologists with us so we can we can introduce this 12 month cycle of being able to do peatland restoration but yeah it's an issue of resources and funding as always Thanks, uh, all the presenters, for that one. Um, just based on time, if we try and cover two more questions very briefly, and then we'll note any other questions and certainly try and get back to you on that as well. So um, there's a question from uh, Tim Coombe about forestry and whether there's any plans to restore any of the land which has been planted on with trees to, to return that back to, to peatland and whether the Forestry Commission is in support. Um, and then separately a question about whether drones are being used for survey or monitoring. Anybody like to come in on any of those, please? Nigel. Nigel? Yes. Yeah, it's David here. Um, just to say, in terms of tree planting on, on peat, yeah, that is interesting because that is actually covered in some of the savings looked for by the sixth carbon budget. The trees under a certain age will be removed from peatland areas where needed. So quite a dramatic intervention, and I suspect we'll need more thinking through, but uh, it is covered in the sixth carbon budget. Okay, yeah, thanks, David. Anybody else like to come in on tree planting? Or? Yeah, I, I find the topic of tree planting on peatlands a really interesting one. 
when you look at the the global scale of peatlands, some of our best carbon stores of terrestrial carbon are in these sort of Siberian forest bogs, where you actually have had this natural uh, coincidence of peat and trees. But then when we try and recreate it, we, just, we, we, we can't. And it's a really interesting uh, topic on the formation of our blanket peats in the UK. A lot of them have formed from about 4,000 years ago when humans and, and the Romans as well, a few thousand years ago, when they came in and actually felled the trees on the uplands, so peat formed. So it's a really interesting one that, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're quite against tree planting because of the 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 drainage that has to take place and what happens to the peat it, you know we, we lose the peat when you do plant trees but there is a world where trees are on peat already it'd be really cool if we could do some research over there and try and recreate that in Cumbria to have these just immense carbon stores occurring yeah, thanks, and um, thanks Kate yes sir. no just to add to that um, I know the Forestry Commission are, are very aware of the, the issue of, um, of trees on peat and some of their um, commercial forestry areas. I know it's not Cumbria, but up, up in Kielder, and we we had a site visit with them not so long ago, and they are, you know, they're they're well aware of the resource they've got there, and are are looking at what they can do to either take trees off or yeah, try try and improve it. And um, yeah, as you mentioned, they have tightened up the rules around around trees on peat. Thanks, Kate. So, um, Tim, I think we're getting to, to time probably, and we may have to take the other questions after the event with follow-ups, perhaps. Yeah, I was thinking that, Nigel. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. There's so many questions, and I'm sure they'll be more generated after the event, but yeah, very happy to uh, work with you on that, to pull those together so we can go back out to everyone on the call with some, uh, some follow-up answers um, from our uh, really, really great um, presenters. So yeah, happy to do that, Nigel. Okay, well, Tim, if you'd like to just um, to wrap up then, I think as we're at, uh, at time. If, um... Indeed we are, yeah. Um, first of all, thank you to everyone for, for joining us today. It's um, great to have so many people with us. Um, I think what's really struck me is the amazing amount of um, expertise and knowledge in Cumbria around this. Um, that's really struck me today. Um, I think it's a real challenge and opportunity around this um, agenda and, uh, and subject. I think we need to do a lot more around understanding who's doing what and connecting people together and how we can uh, work together more collaboratively potentially on that. Um, it's been really interesting today hearing about the um, the data and the and the understanding that we do have already and just how we're able to share that with each other um, and particularly around what Jack presented about uh, understanding more about um, the different restoration techniques and where that can take us on our, our net zero ambition. Um, we we'll also look for shared benefits, I think, and, and uh, around things like nature recovery and flood risk management. Um, and, and if we can understand that better, those shared benefits for each of us um, in different organisations, working in different partnerships, if we can bring that together and, and, and match that up, I think that would be massively beneficial for Cumbria because as I say, there's so much going on. So the, the more we can understand, um, the better. And I think something else just to, to finish on was um, how much we could potentially do working across those partnerships, I think, to, to explore future investment and that longer term funding um, that Kate mentioned to, to, um, to, to, for us to uh, enable us to, to look at these um, projects over, over the longer term, expand the number that we're doing, but, but do more of them um, for over a longer period. So it'd be really interested to try and facilitate that through the partnership if we can. Um, so Nigel's going to um, share the recording. Um, and there's also a fact sheet, I think, um, associated with, with this topic. And um, please do get back in touch um, with us if you've got further questions um, after the event. Um, Thank you very much indeed for, for everyone that's that's contributed today, particularly our presenters. I think that's a huge amount of information in, a, in an hour. Um, so thank you very much indeed. And as I say, any more thoughts, comments, ideas, please just get back to either myself or Nigel. So thank you very much, everyone.